it's Going Up Radio. I'm your host, Aaron, and we have a very special guest today on Tuesday's show. It's the legendary Bob Chapman from the internationalforecaster.com, which is an incredible tome of information that comes out twice a week, and people should definitely subscribe to it because it's really all you need. And right now, we have Bob Chapman. Hey, Bob, how you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. Epic. All right, well, what do you, is there anything that you want to get into right off? Well, I don't know. What is your take on the recent uh, shootings in Tucson? Thank you for asking. Well, uh, I went on uh, Rents last night, and uh, it turns out she's Jewish, He's Jewish, and they knew each other before. And I believe because she was not being a good Zionist Jew and uh, supporting uh, uh, kind of a Tea Party uh, platform board, which is, uh, you know, do something about the illegal aliens, stand up to that thing, him being a left-wing or centrist, uh, was basically uh, bringing her into line, uh, and uh, you know a few other people got whacked in the process. That's how I view it as. I view it as a uh, as a uh, you know kind of a Jew versus Jew thing, and uh, so that's probably way out. People don't want to hear that, but that's what I think it is. I think uh, the Jewish male will try to bring the Jewish female into line when she steps out and starts being sympathetic to something that's outside of the Zionist. Uh, Jew agenda, and we're going to have Brother Nathaniel on in a couple of days, who is a Christian Jew, and he has realzionistcrimes.com, and he points out all the Rothschilds maneuverings and the you know Zionism, and he, that's his site. It's from a Jewish man's perspective, and uh, he has a whole site dedicated. He breaks it down like nobody else does, and I, I'm very excited to have him on the line because he gets down to the root of the. Uh, that or as far as I'm concerned. Everybody else doesn't want to talk about these things. I'm just going to boil it down straight to the root of the matter. It's Rothschilds and Rockefellers. Uh, and, of course, there's the, you know, like uh, Daniel S. Schilling gets into, which is the uh, whole black nobility thing. You know, they're really behind the scenes, you know, but basically the Rothschilds are fronting out the thing. Uh, until we uh, resolve those two issues, the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds, there will be no changes. So that's my opinion. I think it's uh, very valid. Uh, I knew the things that you knew. Um, I think there's uh, another perspective here. Uh, the gentleman who was the federal court judge uh, who was killed in the hail of gunfire, we'll call it, um, he, uh, last week, uh, set down the U.S. government attempt to access pension plans. Really? Yes. <laughs> and uh, I'll have that in tomorrow's issue. You are getting the issues, right? Oh, I've got it open right now on the PDF. Uh, all right. All, I, all, all you need is a yes or no. It'll be in there tomorrow, and... Uh, and I, I think what this judge was doing was what he was supposed to be doing is the interpretation of the law. And uh, it could be that the people who control the administration, who you just mentioned, the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds, et cetera, uh, they may not have wanted him around anymore. And uh, in other words, if you don't do what we want you to do, you get dead. And she could have been a secondary factor. And we don't know how much con control the government had over him or what he had been exposed to in relation to government, if anything at all. So there's a big question mark there. I, 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 think, it, I think it was a government maneuver. I think the end result will be they'll all be clamoring for gun control. And I, I think that his action toward her 
would have been more personal otherwise, but I think the target was a judge. Interesting. So there could be more here than meets the eye. And as time goes on, we're going to find out more and more about any connection at all that he might have had to government. And I, I don't know that at the moment. But it sure st seems strange that uh, the judge would go down right away and it was just after a decision that the people who control government did not want to hear. And so uh, it, it leaves a different... Uh, no, it leaves an, an additional perspective, uh, a multiplicity, more than one reason for perhaps doing what uh, this person did. Well, this is where the truth movement really is, uh, you know, gets to the core of things, which is you got to do your own research. You really got to research, and then uh, if you start seeing connections, uh, then you could start, uh, you know, developing uh, a pattern of behavior or certain uh, things that are, uh, you know, uh, left out Our by theory. the media. Huh? Our theory, you know, they've been behind so many of these. Uh, uh, black operations, and and the public knows it. They realize it. They don't know what to do about it. Yeah. And uh, if if anything, they can do about it because the control of government today is extra constitutional. I mean, they don't care that there is such a document. They do anything they please. I mean, the past president that buffoon said, uh, you know, who gives a crap about that piece of paper? And that's their attitude. I mean, they have control. They're going to do anything they want. And, you know, we had uh, in New Jersey, is it Mr. Wilkerson? Is that his name? They found him in a, a dumpster in a dump. Oh, I mean Wheeler. Wheeler, that was it. Um no, he That's wants very to, mysterious. Uh, Bob, you're getting off on a tangent there. I'm sorry, but no, he just was like, he just wa he was doing a little dumpster diving, and he just kind of wandered in there uh, and keep warm. And he was there's. Are you saying that somebody uh, croaked him and put him in that thing uh, to dump his body? No, he was. No, actually, that's what they floated as the rationale. The official rationale is that he was just kind of like hanging out in the dumpster, and then passed, and then he just passed away. <laughs> Well, the I police read have that. Been I said, believe it. That's the official account. The, yeah, the police of, uh, in New Jersey is, uh, have uh, since said that the man was murdered. Uh, there's no question in my mind that was a government operation. I don't know what he did. I don't know what the, you know, the the background for for a reason to do that. But I, I think that's the case. So the government is very busy. I think. Uh, removing people that they don't want around. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, as you go forward telling the truth and bringing truthful enlightenment to the public throughout the entire world on Blog Talk, you're going to find uh, that you're going to be very unpopular with government. And sometimes they might even come and visit you and threaten you. Yeah. Um, I heard some story, uh, I don't know if you want to get into it, but somebody told me uh, some story about you. Uh, it's super sensitive, I don't want to get into it, but uh, also Aaron McCollum was telling, uh, he put out a link that he's had a, a recent uh, threat against him, and uh, he's pretty active, a uh, former Black Ops uh, member, and uh, so uh, I'll just tell you this, I, had, I caught PG&E. Uh, they're the, the electric company a couple years ago uh, breaking into my garage and then so uh, he had his like hand through, I had the mail slot screwed shut uh, because uh, there was a, uh, this is uh, I don't want stuff dropping in there uh, it gets wet right there so uh, but he did was he took a screwdriver pried it open and was sticking his hand in he was trying to get a mirror in to take a look at my meter uh, and uh so what I did is I saw his hand through there. I came in and I slammed his thumb really hard. And he's all, yipes! <laughs> and then I swung around to open the front door. And I said, hey, 
you know, what's your idea? What are you doing? Busting into my garage for, man. He says, well, hey, we're PG&E. I said, okay. Well, PG&E has a, a rule. You have to show ID whenever you want to try to come into the house. It's the rule. It's in the phone book. It's, it's well advertised. Let's see the ID. Hey, where's your truck, by the way? You say you're PG&E. I don't see any vehicle that says PG&E uh, out here at all. I see no vehicle. He says, well, I don't have my ID, but look at my uniform. It says PG&E on it. I said, listen, man, I want ID, and where's your truck? So basically, he just bailed. He turned around and left. Walked away down the street. I was like, okay, so uh, uh, basically, uh, yeah, I had to point a gun at him, too, you know, and uh, because uh, I didn't know what was up with the guy. And then so like a month later, I got a call from the cops, and they said, hey, why would you point a gun at that guy? And I said, we broke in and everything. So, uh, But meanwhile, after I made the call, uh, some undercovers cruised by the house, and they were really nice. They opened the door for me. I stepped in the back. They said, hey, listen, we think we got your guy. So I followed them, and uh, there was actually a rash of people impersonating utility workers. And they had one guy over on the side, and they said, uh, hey, is that the dude? And I said, that was all, um, I don't think so. They said, but maybe, are you sure? And they kind of like were just like, like, you know, we think that we got the guy. And if you could just please help us out and – confirm our suspicion <laughs> i said yep that's the guy and they were all thank you very much and they cruised me back opened the door for me uh escorted me to the door uh and they were very kind and the, and the cop when he called back a month later he said you know what uh we know pg has got a monopoly and that guy wasn't uh you know didn't have his id or his truck it, it, it was reasonable for you to think it was a scam he said don't be pointing guns at people though you could discharge the firearm and go across the street kill somebody you know then i have to take you uh down uh you know Maybe I have to put you in a lockup. And I was like, okay, okay, no problem. He said, but, hey, thanks for uh, helping uh, our guys out there in that one issue because there are people running around pretending to be, you know, pg e workers. It just so happens that, you know, this guy wasn't, but he wasn't. He didn't bring his ID with him, and he, and he parked the, the truck around the corner. So he was up to something wrong, you know, and he knew it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, well, you know, the, the government has done that sort of thing for many years. Uh, I had my first experience in 1967, and uh, it's relentless. And because I used to have the job that I had when I worked for the government, uh, they think once in, never out, and uh, they think that uh, they own you. And, uh, And so they got upset because of my political viewpoints, and I had to put up with that all you all those years. And they use the IRS. I get audited 15 years in a row. And they never found any funds owing. They just kept on doing it. And, you know, when you hire an attorney and you make a high income and you have to hire an, an extra accountant, by the time I get through defending myself, it costs me a hundred, a hundred and fifty thousand dollars it's harassment and it's never stopped all those years so is it any wonder that I don't live in my, in, in the United States yeah uh this is why I'm this is why this show is called global opposition to new order bolshevik the bolshevism is in hand right now in this country this is what something the soviet union already went through and putin you know credit to him you know, uh, he's no friend necessarily of America. He's not an enemy, though. We got to view the Russians in the proper uh, perspective. Post, pre, and post Bolshevism in their country. Pre Bolshevism, they were in San Francisco. They backed out of there, and they allowed us to become America. They supported us. Uh, they made a fair deal uh, for Alaska. You know, the Russians were never our enemies uh, when the, under the Nicholas II and etc. And now, post uh, Bolshevism, uh, post Soviet Union. We got to remember that we don't need to mess with the Russians. They are our friends. They, uh, we have a good history with them. We don't have really a war with them, uh, you know. Actually, where we're killing each other. So I think we could go forward uh, being friends with the Russians, you know. But the Bolsheviks that run this country don't want that to happen. They are very pissed off that Putin put, uh, you know, that one character in jail. He got 15 years. Uh, he was the Rothschild front that was, uh, you know, buying up everything. Uh, you know, one of those. That's right. Over there. So, he was the last one to be taken down. Exactly. And that I'm was pissed off all those, every one of those oligarchs were fronted and financed by the Rothschilds. Yeah. Putin knows this. He took Russia. And I, Russia. I agree with you on the Russians. They have asked me innumerable times 
uh, to go on television. But I'm not going to go to New York to get on television. You know, I, I don't need it. And uh, very nice, but I'm just not going to. I, I did an interview yesterday with the major newspaper, I can't remember the name of it, in Tehran, Iran. And uh, they were very happy to have me on. They they tried for about a week to find a time slot. So I, I get called uh, by, you know, Greek radio and television, uh, French International, Deutsche Welle, BBC. So I do a lot of that stuff. But if I was in the United States, I would be very, very careful even more than I am where I'm at, where I've been under deep cover for years. And um, these people play very serious games. And um, and so a lot of people like myself, <clears throat> who are kind of like out front, have experienced these kind of things. And uh, But anyway, um, I think that you're right on in your assessment uh of that unfortunate incident in Arizona. and uh, But there is perhaps another perspective. And so I think you people out there should take a look at that. Because um, I always found, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, you know, when something happens, it's not supposed to happen. And it happens in kind of like in a flash. Um there's usually a reason for it that we don't know. And you either got to sit down, if you're familiar with the subject, and think about it. And if you're not that familiar, then you're going to do a bunch of research in order to come up with some logical conclusions. But anyway, it would have been better if it didn't happen, but it did, and that's the way life is. Um you asked at the beginning of the program about important things going on. Um, I brought up that issue in Arizona because of the judge and his decision. Uh, we'll find out more about that probably over the next couple of weeks. Uh, the economy is supposed to be having a recovery and the employment numbers have really not been that good. Over the past two months, that would be number, November and December, and the unemployment figures improved by uh, approximately 0.38% or 38 of a percent of 1%. In other words, they went from 22 and 5 eighths to 22 and a quarter percent unemployment. And that figure is an extension of U6, which is a combination of U1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And U3 is this, the figure that you always see that supposedly dropped from 9.8 to 9.4 percent unemployment. Uh, U6 had a high of 17.1 in November and 17, excuse me, 16.9 in December. And the reason of the difference of that figure in Mayan is that I have eliminated the birth death ratio, which is the birth of businesses and the death of businesses the government uses purportedly to come up with better statistics when in fact it's nothing but a bogus ruse in order to hide what the real unemployment figures are, which in this case are 22 and a quarter percent. So we've had a slight improvement, uh, probably caused in part by Christmas. And there's other standards, which I won't get into, too, too technical. But the point is, unemployment's not going to get better or appreciably better. The money that is being dispersed in the bond market by the Fed Reserve, which they create out of thin air. Uh, that's their main impetus. They started last June, but most people don't know that because 
they haven't been in the markets over 50 years like I have, and they don't know what to look for. And since that time, which has now encompassed six months, uh, the Fed may have spent all of that six to nine hundred billion dollars they were talking about using to purchase treasuries and agencies. Uh, agencies are bonds which are sold by Fannie, Freddie, Ginny, and FHA. And that money, I think, if it's not gone, it'll be gone soon. But it has no direct effect on creating anything within the economy. It just keeps the government from going bankrupt. Because if they can't sell their bonds, they can't fund their operations. And if they can't do that, the, the government comes apart. And so that's where they're zeroing in on. I, I think that by the fall, uh, September the 30th, which is the end of the governmental fiscal year federally, um, I think they'll come up with about $1.6 trillion. And the pork package that was attached to the extension of the Bush tax cuts, which is $868 billion, is a subtle way in which politicians of both parties were able to inject a stimulus into the economy because they didn't want to pass that or try to pass it on their own because they knew that the public wouldn't go for it and they'd be jumping up and down and screaming about it. So that's the way they did it. Uh, that money is already entering the economy and it will do so over the next year. So the combination is $2.5 trillion. And it's the same kind of a package in reality that they had in stimulus number one. In stimulus number one, GDP increased between three to three and a quarter percent over a year and a half. Um, I expect that what they're doing right now will increase GDP to two to two and a quarter percent. Now those figures could change during the course of the year, but that's what it looks like now. So, and that's if they use that two point five trillion. And so we only have a small portion that might get into the economy to help employment. The real impetus is to save the government. Stimulus one, the impetus with all the other programs like TARP, etc., was to save the banking system. And I think they'll be back with another one after that, another $2.5 trillion. And by that time, which will be a year and a half or so away, by that time, we will start to see not only inflation, but hyperinflation. And hyperinflation is when there's inflation, but people don't want to hold money because they don't trust it anymore. And so they spend it as quickly as they get it on food and clothing and other basic things. Maybe they might go in the stock market and buy commodities, gold and silver, if they have a fair amount of money. And so that's where I think this thing is headed. And I come up with this solution last May the 15th, which is way, way ahead of everybody else. And uh, this coming fall, or starting probably in July, August, but the real impetus is going to come September, October, November of this year. You're going to have three negative things going on. Number one, the United States government, the Treasury, has to raise $3.8 trillion. And that's not going to be as easy as usual. In fact... I think that there's a good possibility that what might happen is that foreigners won't be buying much, if any, 
treasuries or agencies. Now, the reason is this, that a lot of buying came out of Europe. The Chinese are not net buyers now, even though they're sitting with $2.85 trillion in foreign currencies. Probably about 1.2, 1.5 is in U.S. dollars. And they're trying to get rid of those as fast as they can because they think eventually the dollar is going to go down because of the way that this stimulus is being handled again. And so the Europeans have got to raise record amounts of money. And in order to bail out the six countries that are in trouble, the solvent countries in Europe, Germany, France, Holland, Austria, would have to come up with $3 trillion. Now, they've already committed a trillion, but I don't see them coming up with $3 trillion. And, But what I do see is money that might have gone into U.S. paper bonds isn't going to go there. It's going to go to satisfy this giant demand to refinance existing debt and bring on new debt as well. And for the Europeans, the first quarter is the worst. The second quarter is slightly worse. And the second half of the year is so-so. For the U.S., it's going to go on all year. Now, the third element that's going to hit the fan later in the year is the inability of the states to get more loans or breaks from the federal government. Uh, That's going to entail a cutback in salaries, a cutback in personnel, uh, early retirement, and uh, that will instill a drop of revenues which are already dropping precipitously for states as well as the U.S. government. Um, The outcome is going to be that many towns, cities, counties, states, and uh, also special projects that were municipal in nature, uh, first of all, are not going to be any new ones. Uh, Second of all, many of these entities will not be able to pay the interest on their bonds because of lack of income. And they essentially will be bankrupt. Uh, The neocons in Congress and outside of Congress right now are trying to put a bill together so that these entities can go bankrupt. And the reason they want to do that is they want the bondholder to take the loss, but more importantly, if these entities go bankrupt, they're absolved of paying any of the pensions existing or for the future and benefits that have been promised to the workers of the entity, you know, the city, the county, and so on. Um there's more than a hundred that are going to go under, and this is why I got the call from Tehran today, or yesterday. Um, I think uh, you're going to have th- three very powerful negative forces going at the same time this fall, and uh, people should be on the lookout for that. Um, people shouldn't be complacent. Uh, They didn't really do a good job of work getting rid of incumbents in the last election. Normally about 6% either retire or get defeated. This time it was 14, which is an improvement, but nothing near what was needed. We needed half of them out at least. And then the people who were elected, we won't know until March or April, whether they're going to do what they say they were going to do or they've been bought off. 
And during December, and here early January, there's parties going on by lobbyists every day raising money for these people. And, of course, the money is nothing less than political payoff to get these individuals tucked nicely in the back pocket of banking, Wall Street, pharmaceutical companies, insurance companies, and transnational conglomerates. And don't forget, if they run again and they've got $20 million and they spend 15 of it and they get defeated, they get to keep tax-free the $5 million that they didn't use. So there's big impetus here to get paid off. So this is the path that we're headed on this year. Okay, can I interject something right there? Uh, that was uh, very nice, uh, something that people should listen to like three or four times to soak that up. Uh, and uh, I want to say a couple things. Number one, if the stimulus and the pumping of the new uh, zeros work, the, the double-edged sword is that uh, inflation has to come. So then the technique will be after that, if it's after all the stimulus is working, uh, it's multiplied. If, yeah, because the Fed uh, pumps eight billion, it gets multiplied ten, twenty times into the system after you know everything happens. Uh, 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 basically, then you have to withdraw, like Soros went into like last year. If it works, the double-edged sword is you have to carefully withdraw it, or you do get for sure the hyperinflation because then it all comes to fruition, all that money. Uh, I'll just say this couple real world things. I went to the post office and sent a few things yesterday. They jacked the first of the year. They jacked everything like 20%. So there's some real inflation. Oil's up. That's real inflation. Second thing, nobody knows about this. I'm releasing this here. <laughs> it's a trip. But like uh, I came to one of, uh, I had this issue uh, on eBay about making a statement about credit card because I was trying to sell, say, sell something. And, uh, like, I was all, well, listen, uh, if you want to use a credit card to buy this, uh, I want you to kick me back the 2.9% that PayPal charges. And then the dude came back with some negative feedback. He says, oh, you can't do that. That's against eBay policy and federal law. Uh, and I took exception to that. I said, yeah, it probably is against eBay policy. It turned out it was, but federal law? So I said, well, I think that sounds like BS, but I'm going to check it out. So I found out, well, uh, I searched, well, who is the regulator for credit cards? And it's the FTC. That's what Google results said. So then I called FTC. I got the first operator lady. She was kind of, uh, you know, not uh, giving me any answers. So she said, well, listen, you know, this loggerhead's here. I'm going to refer you to my supervisor. So the supervisor lady comes on. And she says, well, you know what? There's a reason why this is not all meshy. Number one, Google uh, was, is not telling you the truth. The lady who you're talking before is telling you the truth, but it's hard to understand. Here's what happened. Here's what happened. The FTC has relinquished its regulatory powers on credit cards to the Federal Reserve, man. It's part of that new law that passed last year or something like that. She says all we can regulate now is very small slimmer of it uh, with respect to customers and their billing issues between customer and credit card. That's what we're into right now. That's all we do anymore. We used to cover the whole spectrum of credit card issues. Federal Trade Commission, a, a government body that's supposed to be consumer-friendly, we have now relinquished that all to the Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve now regulates credit cards in, in, in large, in most of the part. Okay, so I went to the Federal Reserve Board. I, uh, you know, I filled out the contact form. I'm waiting for uh, something back. One thing for sure, they didn't send me a notification like I've received, you know, your uh, contact form request has been received, so we'll get back to you shortly. They didn't even get one of those. The Federal Reserve is not set up to be consumer friendly, yet they are now regulating all credit cards in the United States. That's something most people don't even know, but it really tells a tale, man. They have consolidated, they have took more control from the American people. I mean, at least when you had the FTC regulating credit cards. And it's supposed to be consumer friendly. The bias is towards the consumer. Now that the Federal Reserve has got it, I don't know where the bias is, but I don't think it's towards the consumer. No, you're right. And um, I had written about that uh, during the formative uh, time prior to the passing of uh, of this extension 
uh, Federal, Federal Reserve control, they, they virtually have what, what is now a financial monopoly over the American people. And, and to be sure that they got that, last May, uh, the people in Congress were told, you either vote for this thing or we're going to show you what we can do to the markets. So evidently, some of the congressmen and senators said, no, we're not going to fall for that. So they crashed the market a 1,000 points in 20 minutes. Do you remember that? Yep, the fast finger or whatever. <laughs> they, yeah, they the fast finger. <laughs> yeah, well. Uh, the, 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 what does that mean? There's like some me, God there? There's some one dude. He's no, somebody, somebody on the computer hit the wrong number. But let me let me say this: the whole thing was a setup. The SEC uh, looked the other way. It took them six months, supposedly, to figure out what went on when they knew within 15 minutes of what went on. You know, I was in that industry for 28 years. I owned my own brokerage firm, so I'm not some ill-informed dingbat off the street. They're lying. But what they did is they showed the senators and the congressmen. That's just an example. And this is what, before that, uh, this Paulson had told Congress, look, you either do what we tell you to do, or the whole thing is going to collapse. And we're going to do what we want to do. And they backed off. And had they not, they would have pulled the plug. They can make the market go down any time they want. Un under the 19, uh, August 1988 executive order by Ronald Reagan, who had lost his marbles by that time. Oh, I heard what you uh, said about him on, the, on Alex Jones, too. That was a trip. Yeah, well, that's the truth. <laughs> and listen, I've got, I get stuff that if I ever put on the air, I would tell, I'll tell you they would come and find me. They probably don't give a darn about what I had to say about him, and I knew him personally. But uh, the the other things that I know are far, far more serious. But getting back uh, to the working group of financial markets is what Reagan put into being. And uh, what happened was that it allowed – the Treasury, the Fed Reserve, the SEC, the CFTC, and the New York Fed to manipulate markets throughout the entire world 24-7. So we have had a corporatist, fascist government and the workings thereof since August of 1988. And I wrote an article about it not knowing the whole story. That month, and I said that the gold and silver markets were being manipulated. And I explained in the article how. And the, the publication I wrote the article for is still in existence. And uh, so I could probably get the original article. <coughs> the point is this. They do anything they want to do. And they're criminals. They're sociopaths. They don't care what happens to anybody as long as they live this elegant, dilettante lifestyle. And if you noticed just in Christmas that the high-line stores, their sales were up almost 9%. And the low-line stores, the Targets, etc., uh, they were up. I forget the number, but I think it was 1.8 or 2.7, minuscule compared to the wealthy of the country who don't have any kind of a problem spending goo gobs of money. Yeah. And so that's where we're at in America, and it's going to get a lot worse. The rich are going to get richer, and the poor are going to be out on the street. And the reason why this system exists is about the concept that my grandfather taught me, World War II vet, was – it's called the chain of command. Without the chain of command, this can't happen. But the chain of command is why this can happen. And uh, so what I think is that the chain of command is not going to change that. It's going to be uh, there no matter what. 
You just got to change the messages within the chain of command. Uh, it's coming down from the top and it's, you know, matriculating down through the system. People do what they're told for a paycheck. They're basically prostitutes, so they get up in the plane, they just distribute those uh, aluminum oxides, stromium oxide, etc., into the atmosphere, a.k.a. Uh, chemtrails, or they dump the fluoride, which I covered in my video like four months ago, and of course now the government finally admits it, they've the concentration is too high. The fluoride is still good, but the concentration is too high. It needs to be ratcheted back a little bit. That's an admission they're poisoning us. The other countries don't add fluoride. They want to keep us dumbed down. Uh, maybe uh, people recognize, and they'll get their gumption back to do what they need to do, uh, like I think you've mentioned before, or Kaiser has, for sure. It's, we got to harken back to the French Revolution days. you got the elites. They're that was the me. They're enjoying it, <laughs> the dilettantes. That's the only way to bring this back, I think, is, uh, you know, but of course we'll go about it, uh, petition the government for redress of grievances, etc. But we see, like you just pointed out, the other uh, angle to the whole shooting, which is that uh, people that go against the, uh, you know, Federal Reserve. Powers that be. Powers that be uh, are going to have to wear they uh, die. vests. Yeah, they're going to have to really uh, not by, be naive. That when you at this point, if you go with the Constitution and the founding fathers, you better just be ready for it. If they're coming at you, put you uh, six feet under. So, uh, and Brother Nathaniel points this out. He did a great video on this. It's very important to say this. I think is that he outlines that almost every uh, committee head in Congress uh, is a dual citizen. Uh, Zionist Jewish man. And this is coming from a Jewish man. He points it out. He says, this uh, uh, committee chairman, this uh, committee chairman, the head of all of them. So all policy uh, is being dictated by one certain uh, commonality. And that it doesn't respect the diversity of our country. And uh, I think that has to be pointed out. When we get him on the show, he's going to illuminate that hopefully a little bit further. But he did a whole breakdown of it. It just so happens that every one of these committee guys is a dual a citizen, a Zionist Jewish man. And uh, people got to recognize this is the whole idea of the Bolshevism thing. This is how it comes down to it. It's a minority controlling the majority, and then once they've got them, they toy with them like a cat does a, a mouse that has been uh, captured. They bat them around, bat them around, play with them, and, but eventually it's doom for the majority. That's what's going to happen. Uh, that's the bullshit of it, and it, when, it, when it begins to take its ugly effect, which is the murders, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and the baiting of people to fight amongst themselves while the re elites sit back and chuckle, you know. Well, you're absolutely correct, and uh, most of them also uh, belong to the Council on Foreign Relations or the Trilateral Commission or the members of the Bilderberger Group, and uh, that's very common among those people and others in business. Uh, you know, most of them know exactly what they're doing, and uh, if you join, then uh, you become part of the clique, and uh, wonderful things happen to you, and uh, I guess you live happily ever after. And that's what we're trying to stop. And, you know, we, we see these lemmings uh, who are afraid that they'll lose their jobs, so they go along with the program. And it's not only in Congress. It's in business. It's very, very rife. And it's even among bureaucratic appointees. It goes down into workers who work for the states because of all of the federal programs, particularly the police and the federalization of the police. And, you know, you either do it our way, you take the highway. And that's very prevalent today among policing organizations throughout the country. Um, someone said to me today, well, why did the Phoenix Peace Police Department that doesn't have the money buy a thousand more tasers? Well, they didn't. The federal government gave them to them. And, you know, with all this extra equipment and getting kicked back part of the haul that's made from capturing people 
who are involved in the drug trade and all the money that's involved, they get a piece of that. That's been going on for years. Most of the public doesn't know that. And so that's why state, cities, and counties will work closely with the federal government because they get action from them. And then, of course, with that comes the giant SWAT, SWAT teams and then the tanks and all of this other paraphernalia. And so they can run around acting like they're special forces or something like that. And, you know, I think what all of these people in Washington and behind Washington have forgot is the Pentagon does not control the militaries. They might think they do, but they don't. And in a final analysis, these people who run the line outfits, and this even includes generals and admirals who do not work at the Pentagon, and field grade offices and non commissioned offices. I've had hundreds of them write me and tell me there's no way I'm going to execute an illegal order. And that's why I tell people if America has problems, you like you locate the military and join them. Because they're the only people who can save us. The police well, I hope you're right. there's not enough of them. What are you supposed to do? And that's why, I, I, listen, I do a program for over five years on Blog Talk every Thursday called the Marine Disquisition. It is by far the most popular program in that whole Blog Talk syndrome, I'll call it. And it's just the military people. And I try to let them know what's really going on out there so they can understand what they can and they can't do and how they're being used. Yeah, I listen to it. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good, righteous program, totally. I love that one. Uh, and it's good for, like, guys who are, like, in maybe, uh, you know, Angeles City, Philippines, or uh, wherever they might be stationed, Korea, or, uh, Okinawa. So they're all just, all those bases, those dudes, whether they're retired or active, uh yeah, they link up to that show, don't they? That's why it's so popular. It's got a good uh, good demographic there. Well, it has, and I've helped so many of them. One of the nicest compliments I ever got was I said uh, on uh, July the 14th uh, is one of the most important days in the history, and it's a holiday in France. It's called Bastille Day. And I got a nice note through the program and the guy comes back and says I can't believe that you knew that date and what happened and I went back to him and I said I've been there about 15 times on Bastille Day and it's always a great party and a great parade and uh, and so it's hard not to remember it but most Americans don't have the exposure of having lived all over the world the way I have for so many years and you know things that other people just don't know oh yeah I mean I've lived overseas so when you talked about before I heard you talk about uh, like when you're in another country you better just follow its rules and stuff like that <laughs> nothing could, true or could be spoken about living overseas and stuff like that it's not America by the way and uh, uh, those people take a dim view of, of foreigners uh, acting up in most countries so yeah you better play uh Square as possible. Uh, you slip up and one keep little your bit mouth shut. instantly, huh? And keep your mouth shut, particularly about politics. Oh yes, that's ridiculous. You start. You know, when I was living in Germany, uh, I was get killed. <laughs> I, I I was continually asked. Uh, uh, one time, uh, I went to dinner at a restaurant uh, right outside the Hauptbahnhof in, in uh, Frankfurt uh, at Kaiserstrasse. And uh, so he goes in there, and I had a beer, and my wife Judy and I went into the back part where the restaurant is, and there were two couples there. And they were sitting across from one another, and then we sat a little bit away from them. And so these two are arguing. The guys to my right were communists, and the guy and the woman across from me, they were Nazis. So I speak fluent German. So I'm listening to this whole thing, and I'm telling Judy what it's all about. <laughs> so 
they try to get me involved in the conversation, and I said, gee, I, uh, I don't speak German. I didn't want to get involved. And so anyway, uh, they let it go, and uh, finally uh, the communists left. So the other German says to me, and he got a big smile on his face, he says, I know you speak German. He says, who do you agree with? I said, well, basically neither of you. Uh, and uh, I hope that doesn't hurt your feelings, but uh, it was an interesting conversation. And uh, But it just shows you how you could, if you don't think, get involved in something like that. If it turns out to be a fist fight, you end up in jail, and they don't know whether you're a communist or a Nazi. <laughs> Yeah. Uh I've, So you I've keep been, your mouth shut. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh and you play by the rules like uh you uh, go talk about I think on the Dis- disquisition show that's about uh like people looking to expat out or something like that and uh basically yeah, you got to play cool with the immigration documents and your work permits and uh, all your uh, visa issues. Uh because Yeah, uh, it's very important. Yeah. You're a guest. Yeah. And uh you, you do American. what you're supposed to do. It's quite no, the opposite of America different. when it comes to foreigners. It's, it, that's hard for. That's where you start getting the cold water in your face. Is that no, 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 no? You get caught working uh, without a permit, you're probably going to get thrown in an ugly jail, uh, which is really bad. Uh, and other stuff can happen to you. So you have to walk on eggshells a lot of times just to stay out of the out of the beefs, you know, with, that you can. Uh, and uh, you you could be a target as well for by the locals as a rich foreigner. Uh, they're the ones that listen. listen when I was in Thailand a couple of years ago, I walked in on a person that broke into my room. And as a matter of fact, it was weird because the, it was a Thai punk kid, maybe about 14 or something like that. He had broken into my room, the back window, and when I opened the door, I had some gal with me. I opened the door, and I see this kid. He's on the floor, like on his stomach with his hand you know, in his chin, going through my papers. And it was the weirdest thing. And then, so I come in there. I see him. He sees me. He jumps up and bounces out the back window, like down and lands on a, one of those tin roofs. And he was gone. <laughs> Just like that. It was so funny. Uh, so uh, he had probably figured me out. He said, who? I see that, 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 that foreign guy and everything. I'm going to break into his room. I want to study his papers, see more about this guy. So weird, man. <laughs> Well, you know, those things happen, and they happen sometimes for those reasons. And um, crime generally throughout the world, especially petty crime, uh, continues to slowly escalate. Uh, The rest of the world is not going through the horrible economic financial experience that Europe, England, and the United States are going through right now. I mean, Canada and Mexico are booming. I mean, booming. Uh, if there was ever a good time to send the illegals back to Mexico, this would be it. They might be able to employ them. Yeah. But, uh, and I, I say that in jest because they wouldn't take them back. But the point is that... Um, but wait a minute, what, not, what, they wouldn't take them back? You mean like they're not one? <laughs> what do you mean? Cause they, well, they, they wouldn't want them to come back. In fact, uh, and this is interesting, along the border, which is uh, uh, Chihuahua and... Uh, and uh, uh, what is it, Sonora, oh. and some of the states along the border, the politicians locally on the Mexican side have visited Texas and Arizona and, and told uh, the uh, counterparts there that are political that um, uh, we can't have these people coming back to the country because we have no houses to put them in, we have no jobs for them. And it's creating, you know, the ones that are returning home, even though some of them have money, it's creating a nightmare. In fact, in in in, in Mexico, there's a building boom going on. And we're not talking about $75,000 uh, little places to live in. We're talking about homes for, from two fifty to 500000 Jeez. See, what happened with NAFTA... Him? What happened with NAFTA was that the big combines in the United States that produce food, they went to Mexico and said, hey, we can sell you our corn. 
and we can do it for 30% less. And the corn, the corn dealers say, well, why should I argue with that? I can make more money. And, of course, the American corporate farms, they get giant subsidies. And so they can compete with anybody. And they destroyed about two-thirds of all small to medium-sized farms in Mexico. Well, all those people there, there wasn't enough room or jobs for them in the big cities like Guadalajara or Mexico City or Monterrey. And so what do they do? They head for the border. Maybe I can get a job in Texas or California or something like that. Or my cousin, uh, Jesus, uh, he lives in Phoenix. So I'll let him know I'm coming and he'll meet me at the border. And the problem is all of these people had no education. Because when you work in the farm culturally, there was no reason for you to go to school. Now, I know you find that hard to believe, but that's the way it is in Latin America and Mexico included. And so that's why the people who have gone across don't get such good jobs because they don't read or write. They've never been trained. They've virtually never been to school. And that's what caused the great exodus of people, at least from Mexico, into the United States ever since 1995. Very interesting. I like it. So I've lived in all these countries, I know. In fact, uh, uh, in San Jose, the, the crime, the petty crime has gone ballistic. Uh, in, in Panama, now they're asking people for their papers on the street because they look like gringos. Um, in the communist countries, which are Venezuela, in Ecuador, and Bolivia, uh, they tolerate you. And that's about it. Maybe the governments would change. And the same thing in Uruguay, beautiful country. Montevideo is one of the nicest places in the world. And they got a communist. And this guy's a hardcore. You know, I've been fighting in the jungles guy. Uh-huh. I don't know what these people are thinking about. But you can't go to those places unless things change, uh-huh. you know, if you want to live in Latin America. So what's left to you, really, is Chile and Mexico. The rest of them are not easy to live in. Well, I don't have any experience uh, that's any good uh, in Mexico, but uh, I've had a lot of uh, living experience in Southeast Asia, and so I can uh, talk confidently about my, uh, you know, what's going on there. And uh, well, uh, the English do really well. Americans, they do less well. But it's so funny that the English do really well. Uh, they get businesses going. They, you know, they do they, they do everything right. Also, the Germans uh, also do very well, but they stay uh, separate from each other. Boy, I tell you, you can't mix uh, over in Southeast Asia. You don't mix Germans and English. You're gonna have a problem. They stay at different sides of town. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, so, but Americans can be are cool. You can bounce over to the German side, or you can uh, hang with the English. You know, they're kind of blowhards. Uh, you got to be careful what you say because you know they're ready to. You know, throw the uh, War of Independence up in your face. Uh, and then, of course, uh, yeah, being American is kind of cool. You can kind of bounce between all the cultures, but there are problems. Like, I, you know, anyways, uh, but uh, again, uh, you got to remember that it's uh, – they don't have the issue – they have a racist, I believe, a racist or nationalistic uh, bias. You're there as the foreigner. You better have some money. Uh, you better play ball legally, uh, and uh, you've got to watch out for your woman uh, actually having a lover on the side who uh, may get very involved at some point. But what the mistake that they do a lot of times in Southeast Asia is the guys, because they can't own property in their own name and they don't got a company set up to front it and then do it that way, the finagle that way, that they uh, put everything in their wife's name. Uh, you know, their foreign wife's name there, the, the local wife's name, you know, the, the, the national. And, and she has you killed. Yeah. She, you get thrown off a balcony. <laughs> this is the favorite way they do it in Thailand. There's always these jumpers, you know? It's, it's always the Philippines jumping. is alive with it. <laughs> is it? I hadn't heard that. I know Thailand. Yeah, and, and I, they were marrying a lot of military people, and then they were having their boyfriends, after they married the Americans, they would have them cut their throats. 
We've had a lot of reports out of the Philippines uh, to that order. I don't go to the Philippines so much anymore uh, because uh, just uh, my opinion is if you're going to go to Southeast Asia, uh, the best bang for the buck, but it's not as good as it used to be, is still Thailand overall. But if you get yourself in too deep with the locals, you're bound to run across things like that, man, because there's a huge community of people doing that. And don't expect anything from the police, man. You've got no, you're just basically on your own. But nevertheless, these old characters, they come over there and they get hooked up with some woman and they get they put all the money in the wife's name and the property and the motorcycle and the car and everything. They buy her everything because she buffs them out and then they get ultimately betrayed. Uh, but I did have I, – I recently heard of a couple stories where the foreigner uh, threw the woman out <laughs> of the balcony. <laughs> so they're getting a clue. <laughs> Well, you have to have lived in foreign countries to appreciate what you and I are talking about. And I think it must be time for me to leave. i got another program to do. Uh, okay. uh, oh, that was all you get. i got two hours with uh, with uh, Republic Broadcasting. I've been doing that for five or six years. So I'll bid you adieu if you want a free copy of the publication. Uh, just go to our site. Uh, TheInternationalForecaster.com, Forecasters, F-O-R-E-C-A-S-T-E-R.com. We publish on Wednesday and Saturday, about 40 pages each time by me email. For those who are not on the net, we have a hard copy that goes out twice a month. And if you want to call in, which is probably the best way for you to do toll-free, because some of you are not on the Internet, that's 877 479 Eight one seven eight. That's eight seven seven four seven nine eight one seven eight. And actually, you can get your free copies either kind, but they have a special offer there, and you can get a full one year subscription for free. And the offer is really terrific. It's really worth it. So if that's something you have in mind, give them a call. And I will be back again soon. Thank you, Bob. Just let me know. Definitely. I like to be, I like okay. to have it Bob Chapman Tuesdays if possible for uh, whatever time you can uh, spare. Well, we can do it every other week or something like that. You're scheduled though for next Tuesday as well, aren't you? Are you going to be able to make that one on the 18th? I think, or the 17th. Wait a uh, Tuesday's the 18th, and I happen to have my schedule in hand, and uh, I have you down. Epic. So. Unless you've changed your name. Nope. <laughs> You know no, you're do, down huh? for next week. Yeah, what, what do I know? I get so many of these programs, they merge after a while. But i got to run, and I want to thank you all for listening. And uh, it was a great program. Yeah, I think I love it. Thank you very much, Bob. Have a good one. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Yeah. Bob Chapman, signing off. <laughs>